Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will be analysing the important news appearing in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 14th February 2020. The topics to be discussed today are reflected on your screen and the time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start. Now this news appears on page number 9 and it is with respect to the newly notified Medical Devices Amendment Rules of 2020. As per these amendment rules, all medical devices have been brought under the Drug and Cosmetic Act with effect from April 1st. Now this discussion of ours is relevant from the perspective of GS Paper 2 under the category of Governance. Now basically with notification of these amendment rules, all medical devices in India will now be regulated as drugs under the ambit of Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940. Therefore, in effect, all medical devices in our country will be mandatorily registered and licensed in order to ensure safety, efficacy as well as quality of medical devices which are sold in the market. Now, it is the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940 which ensures the efficacy, safety as well as the quality of drugs and cosmetics which is sold in India. Further, this act confers the power of regulating drugs and cosmetics on the Central Drugs Standards Control Organization. So please remember that it is the CDSCO which regulates drugs and cosmetics in India. And very logically, since medical devices are being regulated as drugs, so it is the CDSCO only which will regulate the medical devices in our country. Now in the year 2017, the government came out with the medical devices rules of 2017. Now the reason for coming out with these 2017 rules was that, that till 2017, only 15 categories of medical devices were being regulated as drug. And therefore, the regulatory practices in India at that time were not up to the mark to meet the requirements of medical device sector in the country. Hence, the 2017 rules were brought into effect in order to regulate medical devices in India. So, the 2017 rules acknowledged that there is a difference between drugs and devices. And though medical devices are being treated as drugs as far as regulation purposes is concerned, however, their regulation mechanism is different from drugs. So, before, these, so before the 2017 rules came out, the medical devices which were being manufactured and sold were regulated by multiple agencies, which led to a lot of regulatory bottlenecks, delays, etc. Hence, the government thought to come out with separate rules so that medical devices as a category itself can be regulated in a different manner. However, don't get confused. Since these rules were notified under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act, they were being treated as drugs. Next, let us see what was the need to come out with such rules. First, of course, is the safety and efficacy. Now, we have to consider the fact that medical devices play a very important role in diagnosis, treatment, mitigation or prevention of diseases. Therefore, any substandard quality of device can adversely impact the patient's safety. Furthermore, the Indian health sector was brought into limelight after the faulty hip implants case. And this case, in a way, exposed the lack of regulation when it came to medical devices in our country. The second reason is the growing market. Now, currently, 80% of the medical devices in India are imported. However, the medical devices industry is projected to grow to almost 50 billion by, by 2025. Therefore, considering the fact that the medical industry is about to grow in India, it was very necessary that we should have proper regulation mechanism in place so that we can step up our domestic production. So the second reason is that the domestic medical devices sector is set to boom in India. Therefore, we require proper regulation of it. The third reason was to bring in a single window regulatory regime. Now, as stated, before these rules came out, medical devices were regulated by multiple agencies such as CDSO, Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, Department of Telecommunication, State Food and Drug Administration, Bureau of Indian Standards, etc. However, these rules have now ensured that all medical devices will now be regulated by CDSO only and this in turn will remove interdepartmental delays, overlapping and various other bottlenecks. 
Next, let us briefly talk what the 2017 rules were all about. Now, the main idea behind coming out with the 2017 rules was to remove any kind of regulatory bottleneck and ensure availability of safe medical devices for patients. Now, these 2017 rules were framed in conformity with the Global Harmonization Task Force framework, which in turn conformed to the best international practices. So, as per these rules, medical devices have now been classified into four categories based on their risk. Furthermore, these rules seek to evolve a culture of self-compliance by medical devices manufacturers. In addition to this, unlike the earlier practices where the manufacturers had to apply for renewal of their licenses, under the new rules, there will be no requirement of periodic renewal of licenses. Furthermore, all such licenses will remain valid till they are suspended, cancelled or surrendered. Another important aspect of these rules were the system of third-party conformity assessment and certification. And through this system, notified bodies have been envisioned which will bring the highest degree of professionalism in regulation of the medical devices. And then these 2020 rules have brought about certain amendments as per which all such medical devices have to be registered online with the CDSO. Additionally, manufacturers also have to upload certificate of compliance, mention their registration number, etc. But all these are very technical details which you do not need to remember. Last, as a way forward, it is suggested that given the growing importance of medical devices in diagnosis and treatment of diseases, what is now required is that medical devices should be regulated through a separate law and through a separate regulator. Now, this is a recommendation by the Niti Aayog. By this recommendation, what it basically means is that currently, as we discussed earlier, medical devices are being regulated under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940. So, what essentially is required is that we should come out with a separate law which would deal just specifically with medical devices in our country. Furthermore, it is the CDSCO which is regulating medical devices. However, there are certain doubts about the ability of the, C of the CDSO to effectively regulate both drugs and medical devices. Hence, it is recommended that for medical devices separately, we should have an independent and separate regulator. So this was all about this topic. Let's take our next news. Now, this news appears on page number 15 and it is titled USTR takes India off developing countries list. Now, this discussion of ours is important from the perspective of international relations as well as economy. Now, the Office of the United States Trade Representative has published a new list of the developing and the least developed countries which are eligible for preferential treatment with respect to various countervailing duties investigations. And as per this amendment list, USA has taken India off the developing countries list, thereby taking away the benefit India was getting under the CVD. To simply say, a countervailing duty is like an import tax, which a country imposes on certain goods which it is importing from other countries in order to prevent dumping or other counter-export subsidies. Let us first talk about the WTO's criteria for developing and developed countries. Now, the first important thing here is that WTO has no proper definition or criteria to define which country would be considered as a developing country or a developed country. In reality, it is the countries themselves who announce whether they are developed or developing countries. So from the perspective of prelims, this is the first thing you need to remember that WTO doesn't have a fixed criteria and it is the countries themselves who announce whether they are developing or developed. However, please remember that other members can challenge this decision of a country to declare itself developing or developed. Now, WTO give, gives certain benefits to developing countries. First is that developing countries have longer transition period before they are required to fully implement the WTO agreement. Secondly, developing countries can also receive technical assistance from WTO. And thirdly, developing countries get a lot of benefit in terms of certain preferences they receive from developed countries. 
A good example of this is the GSP or the Journalized System of Preference followed by the USA. Now here you need to remember the second point. Now when a WTO member announces itself as a developing country, it does not automatically makes it eligible to get a preference from the developed country. Rather, in practice, it is the preference giving country, that is the developed country which is giving certain preferences of benefit, which will decide as to which country will it consider as a developing country as far as giving benefits is concerned. So in this case, it is USA who has the right to decide that which country will it consider as a developing country or a least developed country as far as giving preferences is concerned. Hence, please keep this point in mind that just because a country is a developing country as far as WTO is concerned doesn't mean it will get an automatic preference from a developed country. It is a developed country which retains the right as to which country it has to give the benefit to or not. Now having discussed this, let us see what exactly USA has done. Now basically, to harmonize its own law with the WTO subsidies and countervailing measures, the United States Trade Representative in 1998 came up with a list of countries which it classified as developing or developed for the purpose of imposing CVD. Now we do not need to know the name of the US law, but how it worked was that the US authorities had to terminate a countervailing duty investigation if the amount of subsidy which a country is giving was 1% which is known as the de minimis subsidy or if the volume of subsidized import is very negligible. Now understand it this way, USA has its own countervailing measures. Now when USA is importing goods, it has fixed a certain limit of the subsidy which a country can give to its producers. Now the moment any country which is exporting goods to USA breaches this limit, the USA's countervailing department starts an investigation. However, under USA's law, there is a clause. If there is one person breach of the limit set by USA, then the authorities will terminate the investigation. This one person is also known as de minimis subsidy because this one person is too small a difference to warrant any kind of concern or investigation. Therefore, USA gives 1% of relaxation to the countries when it is importing goods from them. And secondly, if the volume of the subsidized goods which the USA is importing is very negligible as compared to the entire volume of goods being imported, then too USA authorities will drop the investigation. Now the catch here is that this 1% is for developed countries. However, for developing and least developing countries, this limit was set to 2%. So basically, USA was giving a 2% relaxation in subsidy limit for developing and least developed countries. And up till now, India was put under the developing countries category. Hence, India was getting a 2% relaxation. However, now since USA has removed India from the developing country list, India will have to adhere to this 1% rule. Now to determine which country will be in the developing countries list or not, USA follows certain criteria. Now these three criteria are first per capita GNI, that is gross national income. Second is the share of the country in the global trade. And third is other factors such as membership of certain groups. Now as far as the first point, that is per capita GNI is concerned, if you look at this criteria, India was falling in the developing countries category. Now USA had relied on World Bank's threshold which separates high income countries from other lower income countries. This meant that all those WTO members which had the per capita GNI below a certain threshold were treated as being eligible as a developing countries. Now here, India does not fall under WTO's higher income categories. So this basically means that India has a per capita income below the World Bank's threshold. So as far as the first point is concerned, India was meeting this requirement. However, the problem came in the second point, which is the share in the global trade. Now India's share in the global trade, as, as far as merchandise and services is concerned, 
was 2.1 percent as far as the export is concerned and 2.6 percent as far as the import is concerned in the year 2017. Now earlier in the 1998 when the list was adopted by USA, USA used to consider a share of world trade of 2 percent or more to be significant which basically means that any country which had a share of world trade above 2 percent was considered ineligible for the developing countries treatment. Hence for the longest time starting from 1998 India's share in the global trade was less than 2 percent. Hence India was meeting this requirement. However USA has now changed this rule and reduced this threshold of 2 percent to 0.5 percent of the share in the global trade. Hence now it means that USA considers 0.5 percent to be a more significant share of the world trade. Hence any country which has a share of 0.5 percent or more will not be eligible to be considered as a developing country as far as the benefits and preferences are concerned. Hence in the second point India was not able to meet the eligibility criteria. And the third point is that USA stated if a country is a member of OECD, EU or G20 then too it will not be eligible for the developing country status and as you must be knowing India is a member of the G20 group. Hence India was not able to fulfill the third criteria as well. Hence following the change in USA's law India is no longer eligible to be a developing country as far as preferences and trade benefits given by USA is concerned. Lastly, you should know that in addition to India, countries like Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam have also been removed from the developing countries list and now are and now are ineligible for the 2% de minimis standard. Now as far as the impact of this move is concerned, the first is that this decision of USA is likely to affect the trade negotiation going on between India and USA. Secondly, now the Indian exports to USA will be subjugated to countervailing duties investigation. And third is that it can also impact the foreign trade between India and USA. These points have been mentioned in the PDF. So this was all about this topic. Let's take up our next news. Now this news has been taken from page number one and it is with respect to the restoration of the Sun Temple or the Konak Temple. Now this discussion is important from the perspective of art and culture. Now the Konak temple or the Konak sun temple is located in eastern Odisha very near to the sacred city of Puri. Now the Konak temple was built in the 13th century by King Narsimdeva I who belonged to the Ganga dynasty. So this is an important information from the perspective of the prelims. Now this temple is dedicated to the sun god and is also associated with Brahmanism and Tantric belief system. Furthermore, it is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1984 and it is located on the banks of Chandrabhaga Lake. Now though today no river crosses nearby to the Konak temple, however it is believed that this temple is located on the banks of mythological river Chandrabhaga which has now disappeared. Now Konak temple is one of the most exemplifying example of the Kalinga temple architecture. Now as you must be knowing the Indian temples are broadly divided into the Nagara, Visera, Dravida and Gadag style of architecture. And this Kalinga temple architecture is a regional variation or rather a subtype of the Nagara style. So though temple architecture of Orissa corresponds to altogether a different category of temple architecture known as the Kalinga style, however this style broadly comes under the Nagara style. Now in Kalinga architecture the temple is broadly divided into two parts which are the Diul and the Jagmohan. Now the Diul is the tar or the shrine and the Jagmohan is the hall. Now the walls of both the Diul and the Jagmohan are lavishly sculpted with architectural motives and figurines. Now as far as the Diul is concerned it further has three types namely Rekh Diul, Pid Diul and the Khakra Diul. And Konak temple has a peel duel. Now specifically as far as the sun temple is concerned, this temple has been constructed in the shape of a large chariot of the sun god. Now this temple basically has two rows of 12 wheels on each side. 
So in total, the chariot has 24 wheels, which represent the 12 hours in a day and the 12 wheels on either side represent the 12 months. Further, this chariot is being pulled by seven horses, which represent or symbolize the seven days of the week. Now, the Sun Temple also has a Viman, which is basically the shrine. And this Viman was surmounted by a tall Shikhar, which was destroyed in an attack. Now, to the east of the hall, we have the Jagmohana, which was basically the audience hall. And then farther to the east, we also have the Nat Mandir or the dance hall. Now, the stones which were used in the construction of this temple include chloride, which was used to build the most important areas of the temple, including the doorways, because this endures very well. The temple also uses laterite, which forms the part of its foundation. And last, the main structures of this temple are made from condylite. Now, another interesting fact about this temple is that when this temple was built, it had a tall pillar known as the Aruna Stam at its entrance. However, this Arun Stamba was removed from the entrance of the Konak temple and placed at the lion's gate of the Jagannath Puri temple. Last but not the least, this temple is also known as Black Pagoda because it was supposed to draw ships into the shore which used to cause shipwrecks. So this is the basic information about the Konak temple which is more than, su which is more than sufficient as far as your prelims are concerned. Now with this, let's take up our next news. Now this news appears on page number 8 and it is titled Time running out to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now recently, the Center for Climate Change under the aegis of Indian Institute of Science has released the Future of Earth Report 2020. Now in this report, they have listed five global risks which are threatening our planet. Now those five points from the perspective of the report are not that important. However, they can be used when you are writing any mains answer on climate change or even when you are attempting an essay on climate change. Hence, the five points which we will be discussing here can be used as fodder points in some other answers related to, related to climate change. Now, the first global risk to the earth is the failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation. Now, despite the various measures to mitigate climate change and to adopt to climate change, global warming is still increasing, sea levels are still rising, furthermore Greenland and parts of Antarctica ice sheets are showing signs of destabilization. All this points to the fact that despite our best efforts, we are unable to control or mitigate climate change the way it should be done. Second risk is extreme weather conditions. Now, some extreme weather conditions will become more likely and more severe in the coming years. Furthermore, these extreme weather conditions are increasing in number, though they are very region specific. Europe particularly has seen a strong increase in the heat waves. The third risk is of biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. Now, it is predicted that almost 14% of the local land species have already been lost. Furthermore, with increase of 2 degrees Celsius in the temperature, at least 99% of the coral reefs will disappear due to, due to ocean acidification, heat waves as well as other pressures. Furthermore, in fresh water as well, the fish die-offs are likely to double by the year 2025 due to extreme summer temperatures. Now, though natural climate solutions are an essential contribution to mitigation, however, they are nowhere near enough to ensure climate stability. The fourth risk is of food crisis. Now, change in the climate is going to reduce our agricultural productivity, due to which undernutrition will be one of the greatest health risk challenge of climate change. In addition to this, the increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide will reduce the nutritional quality of majority of the cereal crops which will affect hundreds of millions of people. And not just this, climate change and the rise in carbon dioxide is also likely to result in 20% reduction in the global availability of protein by 2050. Furthermore, even the global fish stocks will decline with the climate change. Lastly, we have the risk of water crisis. Now it is estimated that glaciers have almost lost about half a meter 
of that thickness per year from 2006 to 2015. Hence, melting of glacier is one area of worry. Second, the changes in glacier snow and ice in the mountains is also likely to influence the mountain ecosystem, which in turn will lead to less water availability for people. Furthermore, the climate change also affects mountain ecosystem and their biodiversity, reducing the area of biodiversity hotspots and causing species to go extinct. So these were the five major risks cited by this report. You can use these points while writing a maze answer on climate change. Now let's take up our next news article. Now this next news appears as an article on page number 10 and it is talking about towards a new world order. Now recently the World Economic Forum held a meeting at Davos last month and there it spoke about what are the current challenges being faced by the world order today and what can be done to improve this world order. Now this article in particular does not mention about these headings which we have given but we are providing this so that it is easier for you to write an answer in the mains examination. The first problem is of social inequality and the growing poverty. Now the latest Oxfam report stated that 2200 billionaires have more wealth than 4.6 billion people. To give you an India specific figure, the Oxfam report stated that India's top 1% hold 51.53% of the total wealth of the nation and this points to the social inequality in the country as well as in the world as well. Second issue is of capitalism's untenability as a concept. Now the ugliest face of capitalism was visible during the 2007-8 economic crisis first in the US and thereafter across the European Union and at that time it appeared as if the global economy was on the verge of slowdown. And this basically means that capitalism as a concept is not foolproof and time and again is vulnerable to such economic crises which have the capability of slowing down or beginning to halt the entire global economy. The third issue is of energy imperialism. Now this basically means that the developed countries of the world as well as China are trying to capture the energy generating resources of the other countries in order to push their GDP. Fourth is toxic colonialism. Now the high amount of consumption of energy by the developed world has resulted in the disposal or dumping of e-waste in various African and Asian countries. Hence this is known as toxic colonialism. Now to counter this toxic colonialism, the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste and their disposal was brought into picture which is basically an international treaty whose main purpose is to reduce the movement of such hazardous waste between the nation and specifically to prevent their dumping in the less developed countries. The fifth issue is that of unsustainable energy consumption. Now developed world and China are ferociously using of the limited raw materials without care or concern for the welfare of the present or of the future generation. For example, US has also pulled out of the Paris Agreement, which is an evidence of how unsustainably and irresponsibly is it using energy. The sixth issue is of unequal distribution of fruits of globalization. Now a few examples of this is firstly, that high expenses and intellectual property rights always favors the rich country. Second is the carbon credit system. Now under this system, countries with high energy consumption trends can simply offset their consumption patterns by purchasing carbon credits, that is the unutilized carbon footprint from poor developing countries and thereby abdicating their responsibility towards climate change. Thirdly, most transactions are based on the arbitrage between price and value difference and due to this, it is usually the middlemen who are gaining and in fact the primary producers are being left out. So these are some of the few problems plaguing the current world order. Hence in this Davos meeting, there was discussion as to what can be the solution to the problems of the current world order. Now one of the solutions to this present problem of the current world order 
is the Nordic economic model. Now, as you must be knowing, the Scandinavian countries, which include Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, etc., are one of the richest in the world and have consistently performed very well on various indices, especially the global, especially the global happiness index. A few important features of the Nordic economic model include large public sector enterprises, universal welfare systems, excellence in public service, high levels of taxation, high rates of personal and corporate income tax rate. Now taking Nordic model as a template, there are certain ingredients that the world could imbibe as part of the new enlightened global order. This can include effective welfare safety nets for all, corruption free governance, fundamental right to tuition free education, fundamental right to good medical care, higher taxes on the rich, shutting up of the tax haven, and nudging the corporates to be guided by the four P's, that is profit, people, planet and process and not just simply working to make profit. Hence the author feels that if we can include some of the ingredients of the Nordic economic model, then the world today can move towards a much better global order. So these are the few points which you can mention in your mains answer. With this, let's take up our next news. Now this news appears on page number one. Now as per this article, the Supreme Court recently has ordered all the political parties, both at the state and at the national level, to publish the, to publish the entire criminal history of all the candidates which they are fielding for the state legislative assemblies as well as for the Lok Sabha elections. Now this information has to be published in all the local and the national newspapers as well as the political party's social media handles. Now this step has been taken by the Supreme Court in order to check the criminalization of politics. Now in the DNS dated 28th January 2020, we have discussed in detail about the criminalization of politics and you can refer to this DNS for more information on this topic. So with this, let's take up our practice question. Now based on our today's discussion, here is a prelims practice question. Please pause the video and solve them. We'll discuss the answer after 5 seconds. Question number 1 reads, consider the following statements. Number 1. Under WTO, countries themselves classify itself as developing or developed. Now this is correct. Because WTO does not lay down any criteria to classify countries into developing or developed. Second. Being classified as a developing country automatically makes it eligible to get preference from the developed countries. Now this is incorrect. It is up to the preference giving country that is the developed country whether it wants to consider any country as a developing nation as far as giving preferences or benefits is concerned. Hence the correct answer becomes A one only. Question number two reads. Which of the following are correct about the Konark Sun Temple? First, it was built during the reigns of the Mauryas. Now this is incorrect. It was built during the time of the Ganga Empire, especially by Narsimdeva I. Second, it is built in Dravida temple architecture style. This is incorrect. It is built in the Kalinga temple architecture style, which is again a sub part of the Nagra style. Third, it is also known as the Black Pagoda. Now this is correct. So the right answer becomes C, 3 only. With this, we come to an end for today's discussion. Let's take up the question for the day. The question for today reads, consider the following statements. Number one, all medical devices are regulated as drugs in India. Statement number two, Central Drug Standard Control Organization regulates medical devices. Which of the statement given above is in our correct? A. 1 only B. 2 only C. Both 1 and 2 and D. Neither 1 nor 2 And the answer for yesterday's question is D. 1, 2 and 3 